So now that we've talked about strepsiride, let's talk about haploride. Just to orient yourself, here are our strepsirides, our lemurs, lorises, and galagos. Now we're going to talk about the other part of the tree, our haplorides. Haplorides are tarsiers, monkeys, apes, and humans. These guys have some different traits from our strepsirides. Uh, now we do not have a rhinarium. So we actually have a philtrum, just this little spot in between our nose and our mouth. So this means we have a dry nose. We're not as good at smelling as uh, anything with a rhinarium. We have also lost the tapetum lucidum. The tapetum lucidum is a little shiny bit in the back of the eyeball that allows to reflect light so you can actually have a chance to see it twice. This is an adaptation to be nocturnal in a low light environment, so it does mean you have a little less acuity in your vision. Overall, in all of our haplorines, we see an emphasis on vision or emphasis on high quality vision. So there's a couple different traits here. We have a fovea, macula lutea, and then really high cone density in the central retina. All of this does is we are focusing our vision on one spot in the retina, which allows us to have really high acuity vision rather than good for low light conditions. We can compare the sensory ecology of our strepsirines and haplorines and see that it's pretty different. Our strepsirines, they have a relatively longer snout, still not as long as other mammals such as raccoons or dogs, but we are seeing a longer snout than our haplorines. Our strepsirines, again, have a rhinarium, but our haplorines do not. Um, strepsirines, they do have a postorbital bar, but it's only that postorbital bar. And haplorines have that full postorbital closure around their eye socket. We see smaller eyes in our strepsirines, but larger eyes for haplorines. Strepsirines have entirely dichromatic vision. But in our haplorines, a few of them do now have trichromatic vision and can see more colors. Our strepsirines have that tapetum lucidum, so they can see better in low light conditions, but haplorines do not. Um, and strepsirines, they are lacking some of these newer traits, the macula lutea and the fovea, which allow for the uh, really high quality vision in our haplorines. Overall, this means there's this emphasis on olfaction or smell in our strepsirines, and our haplorines, we have an emphasis on vision. And this affects a lot of things, one of them being our activity pattern. So in this graph, species that are colored in black are nocturnal, species in white are diurnal or active during the day. Most of our strepsirines here are nocturnal. Um, one e uh, exception are the ringtail lemurs, which are diurnal and gregarious. Um, but remember, our lemurs, they were some of the first to get to Madagascar, so they got to have that adaptive radiation, and that's why we see more variation in lemurs than other strepsirides. On our haplorides, we actually see the opposite. Almost all of them are diurnal. We just have two exceptions, my favorite, the tarsiers, and then our owl monkeys in South America. So now we're seeing a switch to a more uh, accurate vision, um, but also act being active during the day. Let's just take another look at this postorbital bar here. So again, our raccoon, there's no bone right here. Our lemurs have a bone, but it's just this ring. And our gibbon, our, our haplorine, has that full postorbital closure. So let's take a closer look within our haplorine. And let's start with the tarsiers, my favorite. Um, so tarsiers, or superfamily tarsioidea, um, they are nocturnal, so a little weird after we just talked about all of those adaptations to their eyes and being diurnal. And the interesting thing about tarsiers is they are a study in extremes. They have super big eyes. We call it extreme orbital hypertrophy. We have extreme and hypertrophy, hyper, which means um, more, so we have two extra words to say that they have big eyes. That's how big their eyes are. Um, they also have extremely long legs, and they've elongated their tarsals or their ankle bones, for which they are named, um, to make their legs even larger, longer. In here, in this skull here, you can see just how big those eye sockets are for the tarsiers. Put together, their eyes are larger than their brains. 
that is how much they have put into their eyes. They don't care about being smart at all. Their eyes are so big. Um, the muscles that move their eyes around have atrophied. And if they want to look somewhere else, they have to physically move their head. Oh, and before I forget, tarsiers are a little different on the postorbital closure front. You can see there's a little bit of closure there. It's more than just their postorbital bar, but it's partial closure. There still is a little bit of an opening in the back. Um, this has caused controversy for decades about what this means and how we relate them to other primates. We'll talk more about this when we get to phylogeny. Some tarsier traits, they are the only entirely carnivorous primate. It is mostly insects, but you can still see them eating the occasional lizard or even a bird, though those are harder for them to catch. Um, again, they have those elongated tarsal bones. They are specialized leapers. Um, and they, some of them can communicate in the ultrasound, which is really cool. Um, let's take a closer look at their eyes. Um, so they do have, you know, high cone density in their central retina. They have that maculolutea and fovea. But again, their eyes are just so big. But they also don't have a tapetum lucidum. So probably what's going on here is um, the ancestral haplorine, who is the ancestor to tarsiers, was diurnal and lost that uh, tapetum lucidum. Tarsiers are probably secondarily nocturnal and going back, it, they had to make up for not having a tapetum lucidum, so they just made their eyes insanely huge. But tarsiers aren't just one species. There's a lot of diversity within this group that's just being revealed over the past few decades. Um, here um, in the Updated taxonomy in 2014 is this lovely diagram of all of the different tarsier species. So you can see there's variation in how fluffy their tail is, a little bit of their color. Their ears are slightly different shapes, and some of them are larger or smaller. If you look very down at the bottom, Cephalopicus, they have the largest eyes of all of them. They look truly bug-eyed. Uh, but let's look at where they live and how they relate to each other. So we have three genera. We have Carlito in the Philippines. We have Cephalopicus in Borneo and the southern tip of Sumatra, and then we have Tarsius in Sulawesi. We have an idea of how they're related to each other. So in this tree, Carlito and Cephalopicus are more closely related to each other than either is to Tarsius. Um, and we can also look at some of the variation amongst these three groups. Uh, one thing we can look at is the number of chromosomes they have. So Tarsius uh, has 46 chromosomes. That's a normal number for mammals. These guys have 80 chromosomes? We don't know why yet, and this is really confusing. Um, so this is just one of the reasons why tarsiers are weird, and it is a little bit difficult to do genetic studies on them because their genome is a little bit unexpected, and it makes it hard to compare them to other species. Um, but we can also look at some of their sensory ecology since that's been looked at a lot of when we're talking about anthropoids or strepsorines. So here, this shows you the different uh, opsin proteins uh, in different tarsier groups. Um, opsin, these different opsin proteins allow them to see different colors. So all of them are uh, have dichromats. They can have two different pigments in their eye but different species have different ones, and we're not entirely sure why. So there is something interesting going on with the evolution of tarsier vision, um, but we have yet to uncover exactly what that is. If you want to read more, read this great paper by Amanda Moline. Um, and of course, we have to mention that tarsiers are very possibly the inspiration for Yoda. So that is our haplorines. Haplorines are, again, tarsiers, monkeys, apes, and humans. Tarsiers have, are understudied relative to the rest of anthropoids who we know very well. So see me in the next video to learn more about anthropoids. Just to remind you, our anthropoids are monkeys, apes, and humans. They are diurnal. They have that full postorbital closure and, again, relatively larger brains. And now this color vision. Um, this is important because uh, you can see, now we can see different things since we have this extra color we can detect with our eyes. You can compare um, these three different pictures and how they would look for this dichromat. Um, and 
how they would look for this trichromat or this monkey that can see three different colors. So the fruit is a little bit easier to pick out. And some people argue that these predators like this puma here are gonna be easier for this monkey to see. Um, we can also just look at different leaves so we can pick out the red and yellow much uh, from the green very easily. So it is possible to for them to pick out the leaves that are the ones they want to eat a little bit more easily. Um, so next time, we're going to talk more about the anthropoids and the groups within anthropoids. Before we go, can you remember what are the differences between haplorines and strepsorines?